welcome everyone to CBCG's Friday Night Online Fellowship Meeting. Again, every Friday night, we get an opportunity to do this, to visit with one another and hear a message from one of God's elders in CBCG. Tonight, we're going to hear from Norbert Bonnard in Canada. <clears throat> the title of his message is, What is the Relevance in Surrendering? So to introduce to you, Norbert Bonnard. Thank you, Steve. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Hope everyone had a good week as we are approaching the worst time of year that uh, we get on a dear, yearly basis and just hope everyone's well. I'm going to try to give you a heartwarming message and it will not be a Christmas message today. So my title today is what is the relevance in surrendering? Now that might seem a little vague. But I think you'll you'll catch on pretty quick to where I'm going with this. Today in this world that we live in today, we find a time of vast uneasiness, an uneasy change where economic, social, political, and religious turmoil are basically the rules of the day. Yeah, constant bombardment produces a toxic environment that we've living under of unresolved stress. Unresolved stress, of course, leads to disconnected lives. And disconnected lives lead to helplessness. Helplessness over time leads to inescapable captivity. Captivity eventually leads to this desperation. And with desperation comes what we go, what we see going on around us today, in this world today, violent acts and the worst, all under the influence of Satan. Brethren, though we have been called, we have a certain measured distance from this world, but at the same time, we are still living in this world and we have to observe all these things even if it's from a distance we are not immune to what's happening out there to the effects of what's going on in this world today so with this background in mind i want to talk about relevancy today and expound on that as it applies to a spiritually and in this world that we are living in today, as the called out ones. Let us first start by saying that relevancy plays a particularly important part in everyone's lives in combating this world's slide into that helpless state that we see. We brethren can even with what is going on around us in this world not be caught up in this helplessness how do we achieve that brethren how do we achieve that well we can do this when we figure out how can we be relevant this may seem still very vague but i hope to make this much clearer as we progress through the message let us begin with what does it mean to be relevant what does it mean to be relevant well relevance is defined as the state of being closely connected or appropriate to the matter in hand. Relevance is a thought process or state of mind where one feels a strong part of what one feels is important in life. They feel a connectedness to what is important, the crux or the core issues affecting them that they literally have an important part to play in. Brethren, you and I look at the world much differently than the others around us, yet we were still a people who wish to be and feel relevant, to feel important, not from a selfish point of view, rather from a point of view that we as individuals are a part of something. Relevance is an especially important part of that, 
that we be a part of something. While we consider our daily employment, our roles, our responsibilities being of relevance and importance, really, brethren, from our perspective, it is all temporary. The ideas that what the world holds for us as far as what they feel is relevant is a very, very temporary thing. Whatever we do, brethren, is a service. Whether it is to our corporation or what we do for the church, whatever that may be, it is still on a physical plane. The relevance to which we should attain is not that, though it's needed, but really it is dwarfed and overridden by what we really need to feel relevance in. In its ultimate sense, being relevant means to be strongly connected in serving, fulfilling, and an important part of a larger scheme, a grander plan, or the ultimate matter in hand. In other words, what is happening right now? What is important in life? Big question mark. Now I ask you, brethren, another important question. I'm not asking this question from a collective perspective, but is a question that each of us individually must answer. Are you, am I relevant? Are we individually connected in serving and fulfilling an important part of a much larger scheme, a grander plan with the ultimate matter in hand? This is a question we cannot simply dismiss by thinking. Our God promises us eternal relevancy, serving his will, his larger scheme, his grand master plan, the ultimate matter in hand. That is true, but it is too easy to answer that way and say, yes, I am relevant. Since I am regularly attending services and a member of the Church of God, I think I am relevant. Is that a valid thought? Is that what makes us relevant? A part of something bigger, something important? To answer these questions, and I'm putting a lot of questions out there. We should be able to look back each day, each week, and each year as they go by to see how relevant are we. God has his annual holy days, and he repeats them on a yearly basis according to the Hebrew calendar. And we are there learning to get answers to certain questions of what God's plan entails. Each day, each week, each year, we look back and ask ourselves, where am I? What have I learned? And am I, am I actively serving and fulfilling the ultimate matter at hand that God has for me? That God has for you. So let us begin to answer this by looking at those who know we were relevant, who were relevant, and we will again at Christ's return be relevant. What did each learn and do in order to become relevant? What led Abraham? to be willing to sacrifice his son Abra uh, Isaac. Abraham, I think we must agree, is one of the most relevant men in Scripture. What led Noah to spend 120 years building the ark? What led Moses to faithfully lead the people of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years? What led King David not to kill 
King Saul, though he had the opportunity on more than one occasion, knowing God had promised him the throne. What led John the Baptist to accept that he must decrease as Christ increased? And what led Paul to remain faithful, though he suffered much for the name of Christ? And what led Christ to say, not my will, but yours be done? All these names we find in Hebrews 11. And without a doubt, these were relevant men. Christ would say they were relevant men. The fact that they are in the scripture reveals that they were relevant. So we may think the ingredient is faith, since, of course, Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. While faith is required, the relevancy was and will be due to what the faith led these individuals to do. So again I ask, what is it that we must do? What is it that each one of us has to do? Well, let's go to Jesus Christ as being our example. Let's turn to 1 Peter 2, verse 21. 1 Peter 2, verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his footsteps, who committed no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when suffering he threatened not, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Christ committed himself to his father. Abraham, Noah, Moses, David, John, Baptist, and Paul also committed themselves to their father and our father. They all were relevant in father's plan. If we wish to be relevant, we must do the exact same thing. As it says here, commit ourselves. Not something in the future, but commit ourselves. And that means now. The English word committed does not fully express what the Greek really conveys. Let us read verse 23 again. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return when suffering he threatened not, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Another word for committed, entrusted, entrusted, it begins to give us maybe a little bit better understanding. The Greek word is paradolia. Looking at the lexicon, three primary meanings come up for this word. The first one is to give into the hands of another. The second is to give over into another's power or use. And the third is to deliver to another something to keep, use, take care of, and manage. This word means that Christ, while committed to his Father, gave his life to his Father. Jesus Christ surrendered himself, his life, to his Father and to his Father's grander master plan. The definition of relevancy. If we replace committed with surrendered, what do we read? Let's go and put that word in there. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return when suffering. He threatened not, but surrendered himself to him who judges righteously. 
To us, brethren, this means surrendering the life we have to the one to whom it actually belongs, the one that gave us that life. Because our lives are not our own, it was given to us and trusted. And we, brethren, are to surrender it to the one who gave it to us, that being God the Father. So surrender is an absolute necessity in becoming the individuals that we need to become. Now the question is, what is surrender? Well, according to Webster's Dictionary, surrender is an action verb. There is nothing passive about the word. It means to stop fighting, hiding, resisting, because we know that we will not win or succeed. We will not succeed in our direction. And it also means to give control or use of something or someone to someone else. It also means to allow something to influence us or control us. Considering these definitions, have we surrendered ourselves to God, brethren? Have we surrendered ourselves to God? Because in surrendering ourselves to God, we are serving a much grander plan, and hence, we gain that relevancy, that importance. But not importance from the point of view that I or you are someone special. But relevance from the point of view that we know God and that what he is accomplishing is not temporary, but permanent. I'm going to ask you some more questions to emphasize the point of my message. These are personal questions for each one of you. I will also ask this question to myself. If, brethren, we answer yes to any of these, which I am sure we will, then we are not fully, unconditionally surrendered to God. First question. Do I ever strive to control situations and others? Do I ever strive to control situations and others? Do I meticulously plan most things in my life? Do I feel disappointed if things don't go as I planned? Do I feel or reveal agitated, angry, or discontentment at any time? Do I have unrealistic expectations of myself and or others? Do I feel my solutions to problems are better than others? Do I push my way ahead of others? Do my physical accomplishments determine my self-worth? Do I feel put off if my ideas are not accepted by others? Is my self-worth founded in how others view me? All questions, brethren, we should be asking ourselves, and I am sure I am 100% sure that at least one of those questions, the answer is yes. If it is not, come and talk to me later. <laughs> For someone surrendering to the Father, surrender means these things. Following God's lead without knowing where he is sending us. Waiting for God's timing without knowing when it will come. Expecting a miracle. That is called faith. 
without knowing how God will provide and trusting God's purpose without understanding the circumstances in life. In other words, we know we have surrendered to God when we rely totally on God to work things out instead of trying to manipulate or try to wrestle it out of his hands, forcing our agenda and taking control of the situation. Does this all sound familiar to us? When I say control situation, that does not mean we do not plan. But the idea is that we can sit there thinking how it should be instead of looking to God, asking him, and expecting him to show us over time when it will come. All these things, in terms of forcing an agenda, controlling a situation, are works of the old way, the old inner man. Instead, we are to let go and let God work. We do not have to be in charge. Instead of trying harder to accomplish things, we trust harder in God to lead us. Still effort is involved, and we must apply ourselves, which is so important. This can only occur if we apply ourselves and have the will. The desire to accomplish is not diminished, but the realization of who knows best and trust him to do it. Are we convinced that God has our best interests at heart? And that, as it says in Romans 8.28, all things work together for good to those who love God and know that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Let's turn there. Romans 8, verse 28. <clears throat> Romans 8. Read this many times. And we know that all things work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. As we read in 1 Peter, Christ is our perfect example of surrender. We have to turn nowhere else to find what surrender means and what has to be done. Let's turn to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. Beginning in verse uh, 6. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but emptied himself and was made in the likeness of men and took the form of a servant. And being found in the manner of men, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So there we see Christ, who was God in spirit before he came, was also God in the flesh. He did not view his power, the ultimate control that he had, all the rights and prerogatives as God, as something that he felt he had to lay a hold of and claim. While there is no doubt that our Godhead possesses all power and control, yet Christ does not define himself by that power and control. 
he defines himself as we read in Exodus 34. Let's turn to Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no man, means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So Christ defines himself as merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, and keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving in the iniquity, transgression, and sin. He does that instead of claiming the power Christ allowed himself to be subjected to death like every man and willingly surrender everything to glorify his Father and to be an example of faith and obedience for each one of us, brethren. Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5, beginning verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh offered up both prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears to him, who was able to save him from death and was heard because he feared God. Although he was a son, yet he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. Verse 9, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. When Christ and the Father made the decision that Christ would become flesh, he understood that the only one who could restore him back to glory, the glory he had with his Father beforehand, was his Father. He also knew that only through surrendering to the Father in godly fear could he be perfected through all the suffering that entail. How contrary is that to our way of thinking, brother? We are individuals who strive to hold on, yet in stark reality we have no control. We are individuals who fight against suffering instead of striving harder to surrender. Allow it to work perfection and maturity to the whole stature of Christ. That's our human thinking. If, if surrendering was essential for Jesus Christ, who was perfect, who was God, how much more is it for us, brother? Christ told Paul on the road to Damascus, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks, which meant show your opposition to authority, as he outlined the surrender required by Paul to fulfill the purpose Christ had for Paul to do. Christ understood that surrender is the easier path. And he tells us that exactly in Matthew 11, 28. Matthew 11. Verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are overly burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A yoke can refer to any device that assists in carrying out or pulling loads. Christ's yoke was one of total surrender to the will of the Father. In this scripture, Christ is telling us that first we are to take the same yoke of humble surrender to Father's will. Secondly, if we take on the yoke, we will find that it is easier, not harder. By rest, Christ is referring to a life of peace that could only be acquired through surrendering, brother, when you take on his burden. Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God in everything. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honorable, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. So, brethren, if we are to surrender to God, and that surrender is to be easy and peaceful, why do we often feel so heavy laden and stressed? Well, sometimes it is simply our own selfish, fleshly desires wanting to do what we want to do, which, of course, results in difficulties. Remember, we are still human, fighting our human nature. We are carnal, so we always have that battle working against us. Or quite often it is more of a question of our not knowing where our responsibility ends and God's begins. We don't know where our responsibility ends and where God's begins. Overall, God wants us to be people who are responsible, whose desire is to do the right things. So we take responsibility, brethren, upon ourselves and attempt to carry the weight, which to us means we have to try harder. So naturally, we see ourselves as a first resource in accomplishing those things. We are faced with choices daily and decisions made every day in every role that we fill. Whether we are a child, a teenager, an adult, single, married, a parent, a spouse, an employee, an employer, whatever it may be, most of the choices are within the normal course of our day. In other words, when we are first parents, it is very difficult. I just became a grandfather again to a little baby girl five weeks ago, and what a joy that was. But my son and daughter-in-law are still getting accustomed to what it is like to be a first-time parent. There is a time that sometimes it becomes, yes, it is still difficult, but we start doing things on autopilot. At first, we are praying to God, but as we become more comfortable, as we do things day after day, and things that we do that we can accomplish in our sleep, that is exactly the way we sometimes approach it. We do everything 
or a lot without bringing God into our choices. Now, sometimes the choices take more thought. So we dig a little deeper into ourselves, usually our first reaction to find answers. Then come the times when we hit the hard things in our life. If we have wisdom, we realize they are outside of our abilities. We all have hard heads at times, stubborn, and sometimes it takes a long time to realize that we are just fighting the battle on our own. This is normally the situation where we finally, finally turn to God and we look for input. We ask him for help. It is when we begin to surrender to God, bring him into the mix, when we are totally destitute and have no other route to go. We tend to think of surrendering as those moments in life when we must stop and consider what God would desire us to do in certain hard situations and circumstances. Those little moments of matters in hand. And then we submit to his lead. This is good, but if we limit our surrendering to just situations here and there, moments in time, those little matters in hand, we miss the real point. God does not want us surrendering just in situations. God, please handle this. God, please handle that. That does not mean we do not ask those things. What he wants us is to surrender ourselves. We are to be no different than Christ was. How did Christ surrender to his Father? Did he surrender situations? Yes, he did. But he did more than just surrender situations. Let's turn to John 5, verse 30. John 5, verse 30. I have no power to do anything of myself, but as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. I am sure we are all here for the same reason, brother. We look to Jesus Christ as our example. We look to Jesus Christ to tell us the truth. So when Christ says nothing, what does he mean? He means nothing. I can of myself do nothing. Do we think that way, brother? Do we think that way? He did not make any choice decision or judgment using his own will. Nothing too small, nothing too large. We, brethren, continue at times to run on autopilot. Christ did not run on autopilot. He surrendered his will to the Father, who expressed his will through Christ. And Christ understood the weakness of his flesh. He told the disciples, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. His surrender was not only given in particular situations. He surrendered everything. He knew if he allowed the natural poles of the flesh or the body or the mind to go on autopilot, that he could sin. Looking back at ourselves, our personal lives, can we be safe to say that the majority of our personal sins are when we are on autopilot? When I respond to my wife, how do we respond? Many times on autopilot. 
autopilot is the way your mind thinks. When I deal with my colleagues, clients in a way that afterwards I wish I had not, I can honestly say I did not include God. So when Christ says nothing, he means nothing. The epitome of Christ relinquishing his will for the Father is when he brushed aside his will and he said, If this could pass from me, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but you will. It was the Father's will. Mark 14. Mark 14. Beginning verse 35. He then, then he went forward a little, dropped to the ground and prayed, and that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible with you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. For a moment, Christ did tell the Father his situation. But never did he not look at the Father and convey that he was living in the Father. He realized that he could not do what he was going to do without the Father. He knew his flesh. He knew his fear. But he included the Father in everything. <clears throat> it is okay to ask God a question because Christ himself did. It was not outside of the will of the Father that he asked those things, but he included his Father in everything. There was not a moment. No, I cannot do this. I cannot do this. He was bleeding blood, but always was in prayer to the Father. I could not help but think, too, when he went up to the mountains to pray, every day, every one morning before the sun rose, that was in preparation for everything that he was going to do that day, so that he would not do those things on his own, and that the Father was always with him. We know that he had an extra amount of the Holy Spirit and he was directly connected to the Father. But Scripture tells us that if we surrender, truly surrender, which means, even as I am speaking here now, I do not know all that entails. What is total surrender? Because I have not done it. Have you totally surrendered? We know that Jesus Christ has, but we have not done it as God's people. It is a process, brethren. Yes, it's all part of the process. It's part of the conversion process. As we struggle for our own relevancy, we need to understand that surrendering to the Father is where it begins. Christ's surrender was driven by two godly, non-fleshly purposes. The first was to reveal the Father to mankind, John 14, verse 8. John 14, verse 8. Philip said to the Lord, I said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so, so long a time, and you have not known me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. Why then do you say, Show us the Father? <clears throat> Christ's first reason for surrendering of his will was so that man would know the mind of the Father 
And so Christ would not interject anything other than what the Father had desired to be revealed. Have you ever found yourself talking to someone who has questions, worried, and needs your help? We in the ministry find ourselves in that situation quite a lot. Do you find yourself surrendering to God at that moment to give an answer? Why? Because of not wanting to come between man and other people and God. That is where prayer, and that is why Christ prayed continually, because he did not wish to become. He pointed always to the Father. There was no other way. Our surrender, brethren, should be no different. Now, secondly, he wanted to make sure that the Father received the glory and all the credit. Verse 10, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak from my own self, but the Father himself who dwells in me does the works. Brethren, our surrender is no different than Christ's. The old fleshly ways want their glory, while the surrendered only desire to glorify the Father. Our surrender is to be that we in our lives reveal the Father and that we give glory to the Father. There's also another reason why we can find ourselves heavy laden, brethren, and struggling with the concept of surrendering. It stems from fear and from guilt. When we do not have the correct perspective about surrendering, we rely too much on our own strength to overcome and change. If you are like me, whenever I try to do this, I totally fail. We all think we should be stronger than we really are. We are told we should worship our Father in sincerity and in truth. Part of having that sincere truthfulness is knowing who we are and what we are. For when we are sincere and truthful about who we are with our Father, we see someone willing to surrender to Him. Psalm 34, 18. Psalm 34, verse 18. <clears throat> the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and, say, and saves those who are of a contrite spirit. When we know our state and express it to our Father, that is when we draw near to our Father and we allow him to actually work in our lives. James 4. James 4. Beginning verse 7. Therefore submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be grieved and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into grieving and your joy into mourning. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. We must realize that our conditions, our condition is terminal. And without our Father's continual healing of our fallible state, we will fail, brother. We do not and never will have the strength to overcome 
without our willing submission to his direction and his care. It is his strength and his involvement which overcomes our sins. It is our submission that enables it. That is part of the will that we need to put forth. Draw near to God. Share with him our weaknesses, our struggles. Recognize those struggles. We all have them. We many times have the thought of saying, it's okay, we are only human. That's the excuse we use. Use that with a deep understanding of how much our need is for God. We, on our own, by ourselves, can do nothing. We often do not stop and realize that God knows whom he called. He knows each one of us. Sometimes we run around trying to hide our sins, pushing them off into the corner and pretending that God does not see them. But God knows who we are before we see it ourselves. And the people he called were not the wise of the world, as we are told. It was those that he knows he can work with, brethren who will honestly look at themselves over time and, of course, with that, change. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. Verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that there are not many who are wise according to the flesh, not many who are powerful, not many who are a high-born among you. Rather, God has chosen the foolish things of the world so that he might put to shame those who are wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world so that he might put shame to the strong things. And the lowborn of the world and the despised has God chosen, even the things that are counted as nothing, in order that he might bring to nothing the things that are. Verse 29, so that no flesh might glory in his presence. No flesh. Last time I hit myself against something, it hurt. Last time I got ill, I did not feel well. Let's turn to verse 30. But you are of him in Christ Jesus, who was made to us wisdom from God, even righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Verse 31. So that as it is written, the one who glorifies, let him glory in the Lord. Brethren, we... Each one of us really does not bring nothing to the equation other than surrendering. It is not God plus us that equals glory. It is God who equals glory. And we need to be okay with that concept. It is part of the yoke, part of the surrender portion. It is only through the recognition of our weaknesses that we can surrender to God, and he is able to live his life powerfully through us. When we recognize our weaknesses, we are better. We are stronger, brethren. First, second, uh, second Corinthians 12, verse 9. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly will I boast in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. For this reason, I take pleasure in weaknesses, in insults, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul is talking about here in a physical sense. But the same thing is true spiritually. 
when we recognize that we are spiritually weak and we go to God and we surrender to him, he will make us strong. He will make us strong. When we are weak, we are more willing to surrender to God because we cannot do it ourselves. We understand our desperate need for him when we recognize our weakness. We strive to be always near him. When we recognize that we are weak and we live our lives according to that, brethren, you literally begin to feel that if you have not been in contact with God for a portion of the day, or even a day, the hours, you begin to feel that loss. That is the type of surrender God wants. Being human is not something that should cause us guilt, but rather it should drive us to our knees to ask God to help us surrender to him who has already won the battle. Jesus Christ has already won the battle. He surrendered. He asks the same of us and asks us to also recognize what Christ has done for us. Romans 8 verse 37. Romans 8, verse 37. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. That whole phrase is just one work. Hooper Nikkeo. It only exists once. What it means is when the enemy attacks... He has lost the battle before it started. That you are a super conqueror. That we in our weakness and the fact that we have come and surrendered to God and that he is with us, then we, just like Christ, begin to conquer through him who loved us. Verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we surrender, our Father and Jesus Christ put their arms around us and never let us go. Be true to them. They will be looking after us. Take care of us. They will. Not run off this way or run off that way. But we must trust God. If we could do it on our own, we could glory in ourselves, brethren. But flesh and blood have no glory. Somehow we think we are responsible for our salvation. If we think that way, we are already dead. It is Christ's responsibility. He tells us that in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 1. 1 and 2. Hebrews, Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great throng of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily entraps us, and let us run the race set before us with endurance. <clears throat> verse 2. What we must do. Having our minds fixed on Jesus the beginner and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that lay ahead of him endured the cross, although he despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Brethren, when we take a deeper look at surrender, all meant to lead each one of us to the point where we admit that God is the one that will get us there and that we, by ourselves, are not adequate. We cannot pass the test. 
we cannot make the grade. We do not have the faith. We come to admit without exception that God is our only salvation. When we are finally led to the point, instead of giving up and becoming irrelevant, we give ourselves wholly to God so that he may accomplish whatever it is he has for each one of us to do. God has a plan. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. And we submit to whatever he allows so that we might mortify the deeds of the flesh and from that death bring forth a life that pleases Christ and the Father. Brethren, we are not unique from the world when it comes to experiencing the economic, social, political, and religious turmoil. But we strive in its midst to make ourselves relevant by defining God's temporary, grander purpose and plans. However, we do not have the burden of defining of defining the grander plan or purpose. It has been defined for us, brethren. We need not fall for the plans or purposes that are defined by the world that is around us. Instead, we must surrender, brethren, every moment of our lives to our Father's grander plan his master plan he has set aside for mankind and for us the first fruits and purpose and realize that through that we will gain eternal relevance. So brethren, I end this message today and ask you again, are you, am I relevant to surrender to God.